East eats West. <laughs> There's a moment from many years ago that remains indelible on my mind. I don't remember much on our way there to Waterloo, except that the countryside was streaked and blurred, light green over darker green, all under a persistent gray sky. Father drove. My older sister sat next to him and navigated a map on her lap. A pouting teenager, I sat behind with mother who complained of a mild headache and wondered out loud why we needed to find this distant battlefield and why we couldn't go freshen up at our hotel after having just arrived in Belgium. It would be dark by the time we got to Waterloo had we gone to the hotel, father snapped. I didn't have to turn to know mother was rolling her eyes. If she had a choice, she would have been at the hotel and would not have been stuck in the back seat as we searched for some pasture where long ago Napoleon was defeated. I thought I saw a sign in French. I said so to father, except it took me five minutes to get around to doing this. He cursed, calling me names in French. I responded in French, rather rudely, which surprised him since I rarely spoke the language after we came to America. I felt terrible afterwards, and the air in the car was tense. I remember thinking, were we still in the war and I was his subordinate? Father, a three-star general in the South Vietnamese army, no doubt would have confined me to the brick or whatever it was that I said, or whatever it was that I said. But it was half a dozen years since the Vietnam War ended and we'd already turned into an American family on a European vacation. <laughs> complete with a sulky teenager stuck in the back seat and his responsible but equally sullen sister stuck in front while their quarreling parents kept at it. We finally stopped and asked for directions. Father drove frantically after that. We arrived at Waterloo at last and it was still bright out when he, my sister and I rushed up the windswept knoll that overlooked the battlefield. Mother declined the climb and went to the shop to buy souvenirs instead. <laughs> As we climbed, Father could barely hide his excitement. When we finally stood on top, almost out of breath, he began to narrate the story of old battle. He pointed wildly where Napoleon's army stood, which direction the Prussian soldiers came, soldiers came from, and how the Duke of Wellington arrived with his anglo ally forces to turn the tide defeating father's favorite military tactician and ultimately exiled him to St. Helena where he died a few years later. I already knew the story. I also knew that father was in part trying to make up for cursing at me by telling the old story. It occurred to me that my older brother would have enjoyed this trip far more than me had he come and it would also occurred to me later that never once had father told any of his children a fairy tale, and that most likely he remembered none. But this story of a long ago battle he had told many times, turning our dining room table into a battlefield, and our spoons and chopsticks into battalions, bowls into hills. The Duke was drunk, Napoleon was not. But there was nothing he could do, was there? against fate. My father was second in command at i -Corps near the end of the war. He was fighting at the DMZ and nearly lost his life but managed to escape back to Saigon. He boarded a naval ship on the day Saigon fell and headed for Guam. After four years in America, in a remarkable feat, he had remade himself at age 46 into a bank executive. Yet father's passion remains extraterritorial. Life in America turned out to be, for him and for my mother, a big letdown, a reality defined by disappointment and a deep sense of loss. They would never have in America what had been taken from them in Vietnam. For years, their biography of sorts was on display on a mantle in the living room, framed black and white photos that my brother managed to take with him as a foreign student in the U.S. before the war ended. In one folder, father is emerging from his helicopter, silver baton in his left hand, his right reaching out to a young army officer who stands with hunched shoulders under the whirling rotor blades that send wind to press down on the elephant grass. In the distance are the silhouettes of bent back farmers in conical hats. Father's face is dark and somber. In another, mother and father, 
A beautiful couple would be understating it. She wears her multi-stranded gold bead necklace outside her lavender brocade. She looks stunning and regal. Father on the thin side is dignified and suave in a great silk suit, a cigarette in his hand. The picture is most definitely posed. It is the first day of dead. Behind them, two Chinese brush paintings hang on the wall, one showing the gathering of Chinese fairies on the clouds, the other a ferocious dragon descending from a misty mountain. I don't know why, but sometimes when I think of that picture, I have flashbacks to being a little child hiding inside mother's walk-in closet the size of a small room with windows open and the breeze swaying the, and the hundred of painted embroidered Aoyai dresses and brocades. I can still smell the camphor and mother's perfume, Guerlain. I am lost amid the fabric. From far away, I hear my brother's voice calling out, Father's home, Father's home. None of the pictures show how it ended. There are plenty of those online under fall of Saigon or April 30th, 1975 or Vietnam evacuation. Tens and thousands of them. Tanks rolling inside Saigon, helicopters flying out to awaiting American ships, fear-stricken Vietnamese climbing over the barbed wire walls of the U.S. Embassy. There are many pictures of refugees in crowded cargo planes landing in the Philippines. And I suppose somewhere there are pictures of me and my mother and sister and two grandmothers emerging from one of those planes with small bags in our hands, looking very, very lost. I remember much of the day we left, the wails of a woman, the smell of vomit, night turning into day back into night, the humming of the plane's engines. Then we landed in Subic Bay. Then there's another flight to Guam, then green tents flapping in the wind, a scorching sun, a very long line for food, adults weeping and screaming as the BBC announces the fall of Saigon. The father left us on a warship with hundreds of well-placed others for the U.S. Navy base near Subic Bay and Asylum. He folded away his army uniform, changed into a pair of jeans and a t-shirt, and tossed his gun into the sea. After that, Vietnam, his defeat, his raison d'etre, his crucible, was never far from his consciousness. The war, his role in it, had become for him the touchstone of his life. He knows wars, he studies wars, and read countless books on battle strategies and warfare. And Napoleon was his hero. After so many years of hearing about Napoleon, it should have been exciting seeing the place finally. Yet that late summer afternoon, I was no longer intrigued. I was homesick for California. I missed my lover terribly, my first love, our tender kisses, the smell of our sweat. I kept replaying our visit to the ocean with the breeze carrying the smell of the sea, how shy we both were, yet how inextricably drawn we were to one another, the orange red sunset and an unfinished sand castle between us. All I can think of the entire trip was getting back to California to possess, to love. This was why it had taken me a long time to process that we were going the wrong direction. <laughs> it was also why, while Father talked on, I was miles away. It was only when he himself stopped talking and looked out to the far off distance to where I suppose Napoleon fled that I turned to look to. But I didn't see anything resembling a battlefield. What I saw was a thin gray mist drifting lazily over a green pasture below. And in the cold air, I smelled a musky odor of newly upturned earth. The pastoral scene at twilight stirred in me no martial passion, but instead poetry and an unspeakable yearning. Father talked on. His hair was tousled by the wind, his face contemplative. And as I watched him, the image came to me suddenly on, of him on that naval ship near the Philippines. The government 
of the Philippines wouldn't let the South Vietnamese ship dock unless all personnel turned in their arms. I imagine him, his face creased as he stared at his gun for some time before tossing it into the churning sea below. Something, a welling, a sharp pain, rose suddenly within me then, and it surprised me that I hadn't felt anything like it before. And it felt close to pity. It lodged in my throat and it took some effort not to cry out loud. There on the windblown hill, with the statue of a lion on a pedestal above us as a memorial for all fallen soldiers. Father seemed so utterly alone, but then suddenly, so was I. Mm. Frightened and full of my own inarticulate longings, I had to look away for fear that Father might see tears brim in my eyes and think that I too was mourning for Napoleon's defeat. <laughs> Was it not then that my life turned? Was it not then that I, still owned by a collective sense of loss, nevertheless took some profound step out from under his shadow? I went on to college in the fall in any case, and then after bouts of bickerings with my parents, onto my own writing life, following my own passion. I've been to Europe a few times since then, to Amsterdam, and even to Brussels. And though I think about it, even entertain the idea, not once did I feel compelled to visit that old battlefield again. Mm -hmm.